it's kind of an odd little book, and it's, and it's kind of fascinating. And in fact, to fully understand the book, you have to, uh, there's an idea that we love, okay, that's, that exists in this book. It's an idea that we all love, and I think the best way to express that is to talk about one of the most classic movies that I can think of, right? Back to the Future, Right, that's, uh, like that, that's, has everyone seen Back to the Future? Yeah, yeah? yeah there's a, probably a couple people that haven't, right? Like that's, and that's, think about, this movie is over 30 years old. Think about that for a second. Like there's, a, <laughs> there's like, like that is, that is wild. This movie came out in 1985. Like that's, I was born in 1982, okay? <laughs> like, like that, that's, and I'm just decidedly middle aged. Like, like that's that's what's going on now. I got, that's what's that's wild, right? This book, this movie, and it's a great movie. Uh, and and I have a video clip that's kind of kind of near the beginning of the movie, but it shows this thing that 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 Obadiah is about that we absolutely love. Now, the original clip here was like three and a half minutes long. That's a little too long. So I shortened it down. So if it feels like it's moving fast, that's why. All right. So volume, please. How much money you got on you? Well, how much you want, Biff? <laughs> now, I'm whoa, gonna... whoa, Biff. What's that? <laughs> Kid, kid, stop, 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 stop. Hey. Oh, boy. I'll get it back to you, all right? Broken. What's that thing he's on? It's a board with wheels. It's an absolute dream. Come on, come on, come on, come on! <laughs> Kid. All right, yeah, that's, so what's your favorite part of that clip? It, like, right? It's when they, they go in and slide and they hit the manure, right? Like, that's, like, we, we love, we love the manure, don't we? We love that, that scene. And all, like, these classic movies have these, these tropes of, of kind of this comic kind of t- timing of where someone ends up, like, slamming into manure. And that joke goes through all three of those movies. The Biff character ends up in manure in all three of the movies. And we love it, right? Like, it's like, it's like yes. Like, like, the bad guy gets his comeuppance. He was trying to hurt Marty McFly. And, 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 he, and he got and he got his thing. Like that's, that's what we love. We love that sense, right? We, we love it. And that is kind of what Obadiah is dealing with. He's dealing with this idea of us loving the fact that someone else is getting the pie in their face, right? They love it that, they're, that, that, that it's this manure that it's going after them. And, and let's, let's, let's go into Obadiah, and we can see this in verse 11, kind of right here at the beginning. It's all kind of cryptic, but it's here. On the day that you stood aloof, okay? On the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. What that's saying here, and this is, this is why you have to kind of wrestle with this thing, is that there's two, this is a story of two countries, right? Two countries. You have Israel and you have Edom, 
All right, you have, you have these two countries here, and what happened is that they, were kind of, they, they just didn't like one another. You know, in Jesus' day, no one liked Samaritans. Remember, you've heard lots about the Samaritans. This is kind of like that. This is a close group of people to the nation of Israel, and they hated each other. They hated each other. They always were looking for the downfall of the other one. And what happened in Israel, Israel, Babylon came and took over Israel, started fighting and had siege over that. And you would think that this other small country, Edom, would have come to the rescue of Israel. And they're like, nope, I'm going to ram them, right? And they're, and they're like, ram them. So they actually went to smaller towns and started, uh, started pillaging those smaller towns and started helping Babylon. And Obadiah is like, you guys are terrible. Like, like you know, we could have used you. And here's the kicker. Do you know where the people of Edom came from? Do you know where they came from? Esau. Somebody, somebody read ahead. It's okay. That's good. It's good to know that. It's Esau. Esau. Now, you're, now some of you are like, who's Esau? Why does that matter? All right, remember you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like these, these patriarchs in the scriptures. Well, Isaac's son... He had two sons. They were twins, and they were Jacob and Esau. Now, did Jacob and Esau get along? No. Here's what's funny to me. All right. My six-year-old nephew is named Jacob. When he was born, it was the number one name in the whole country to name a boy who was, who was that, that age. You know what the number one name was in 1982? Chris. Chris. All right? Like, that's just, they issued my name out to demographics. They're just like, you shall be named Chris. There was, in my church, it was a little bit bigger than this one I grew up. There were five of us in the youth group, all named Chris. All right? Everyone had nicknames except for me. All right? I don't know what that says. Anyway, but, they, but Jacob, it, it, so when it was born, Esau was born first, and Jacob was grabbing his heel, it said, as he was coming out. So it's almost like, it's, it was almost like the picture that the Bible's giving is like he was trying to almost come out first. You know, that he was trying to pull him back into the womb. So it's like, nope, I'm going to be first. And, this, and the Bible's telling the story about how Jacob and Esau were going to be bitter, bitter fighters the whole time. And so they named him, because he was holding onto his heel, they named him Jacob which were like, oh, that's a sweet name. And I always laugh at that because that name means you're a jerk, basically is what this name means. It means like heel grabber. It means usurper. It means like I'm going to do anything to sell you out so I can be bigger than you, right? Like that's what that name means. So if you have a friend or a daughter or your grandkids named Jacob and he's a bit of a jerk, they named him that, right? Like that's, he's just living out his calling, Right then, some of you are like, mine's sweet. No, he's not. Like, that's, I have a nephew. He's this tall. He's funny. He's funny, but he would sell you out for a cupcake. Like, like that's, <laughs> he would. He would. He's a funny little kid, though. They, um, but but that's, that's what Jacob means. And they live out in that, and they constantly are fighting the, this whole time. And it comes, and, and Jacob does some nasty things to Esau. One of the things he does to him, Esau's famished, and Jacob's like making some stew. He's like, hey, you hungry? And he's like, I'm so hungry. It's like you have a nice bowl of ramen, you know, and you're like, you hungry? It's like, it's like give me something I want. You know, I want your car type of thing for like a stew. And that's kind of what it is. He sells his, his birthright to Jacob for this stew because he's so hungry. I don't know if that stew was worth all that, but, you know. I guess in the age before microwaves, you got food where you could get it, right? They, uh, like we could go to the store and get a Hot Pocket. But, um, but it's, it's different then. And then also Jacob dresses up like his brother. And he tricks his own father into giving him the older son's blessing. You know, it's, do you think Esau would be happy with that? No! Not at all. Like they bickered and bickered and fought this Jacob and Esau, right? They, they fought. I think, I think that's hilarious too. Don't worry about it. But that's, the, they, they bickered and fought the whole time. And in fact, when Jacob stole Esau's blessing, 
He was no longer safe to live there, so he went and moved and lived in with his uncle Laban. And then there's all these stories with his uncle Laban and him cheating and stealing out of just being a jerk to his uncle Laban. And Laban finally kicked him out. Laban got him back a couple times too. There was he he actually tricked uh, he 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 tricked. Um, Jacob into marrying his, his, one of his daughters that he didn't want to marry, and that daughter was known for having weak eyes. I don't know what that means, but it's not a positive thing, okay? So he ended up tricking him. There's a lot of weird stories in the Bible, but that's, he ended up tricking him, and then, and then all of a sudden, Jacob didn't have anywhere to go, and like, sin, he, he had to go back to his brother Esau, and he was scared that Esau was going to kill him, so he just sends gifts back to them, sends gifts. It's like, it's like you guys who know that you've messed up and you, like, you preemptively are offering gifts as you come in the door. Like you have flowers in your hands. You have all these different things, right? You're just sending all these gifts. That's what, that's what Jacob was doing to Esau. And Esau ended up inviting him back in. But that animosity continued to live on with their respective countries that came out from them. Because out of Esau came Edom, and out of Jacob, Jacob's name term became Israel, became Israel. And that animosity between those, it's kind of like the Hatfields and McCoys. You know, they probably don't even know why they're fighting anymore. They just know, I hate you, right? Like, and so they're just continuing to fight. And this continues on, and Edom lived up in this, like, hilly area of the mountains. They lived up in the top of the mountains, so they were kind of in a secure place. And they also had, like, this trade route that they were, that they were managing, so they were able to get money from that. And, and they, they were in this pretty secure place, and then Babylon showed up and began to siege Israel, and, and Edom didn't do a thing. In fact, they helped Babylon, and Obadiah is like, you guys are terrible people. You're terrible people. Why did you act like this? Why did you act like that? And it goes back to the manure, right? Like, we, we have... People that we view as our enemies, and we're like, yeah, that's it. Like, we see something bad happen to them, and it's like, yeah, hit into that manure, right? We, we love it, and that's what, that, and, but it makes sense that Esau, that Edom would be upset at them. Jacob stole their blessing. He stole their blessing. He stole it from them. Like, that's, and it makes, it makes sense that they would be upset at this, so Let's look at Obadiah again near the beginning of it this time, verses 3 and 4. And so he says, he's talking about this. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the raft in your lofty dwellings, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you soar aloft like an eagle, though your nest is set among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. You see, they are up in the clefts of the rocks. This all sounds like, like poetry, po- po- poetic weirdness, but when you understand the story and who Edom is, you start actually seeing what he's talking about. He's talking about... He's talking about Edom. He's saying that their crefts in the rocks are almost like their pride, and their pride is going to be their downfall, that they haven't been humble, and wrath is coming. But, but you might be saying, you're like, okay, this is fine. This is fine. I understand that it's in the Bible, but so far I'm beginning to see why I've never really studied this book before, Right? I've never really studied here like it's, why are we discuss, discussing it now besides having like a weird little sermon series? Why, why is this book even in here? If it's just about this tussle, about this land war between these two rival countries, all this kind of makes sense. And, and, and this, what we're about to talk about is why we're discussing it today while we're there. Because all of all great stories kind of have a pivot, right? They all have a pivot. And that's what Obadiah does. He has this interesting pivot in verse 13. Now, we, I think we've all done pivots. Many of you have probably had employees underneath you or something like that, or you've had to talk to somebody, you had to talk to your kid, you have had to sit them down, and, you all, and the conversation goes something like this, right? Listen, you're doing your chores well, 
you're, you're, you're a good employee, you're doing this well, you know, all, all of that. But, but then there's the pivot, right? But, but you need to stop dumping water all over the floor or something like that. I don't know, I was trying to think of something funny, but I couldn't. But like, you, you need to stop doing this over here. Like there's always that pivot. Verse 15 has that pivot. And so, well, maybe. There it is. For, for the day, so he's talking about how Edom has caused all this damage and all these terrible things. You can see above it, it says, do not stand at the crossroads or cut off his fugitives. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. For, for is the same word as but in Hebrew, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you, and your deeds shall return to your own hand. Suddenly there's this pivot in the story, and the story becomes bigger than just Edom. Okay? And you kind of see suddenly what Obadiah is doing. Notice what he says. For the day of the Lord is near upon all all nations upon, the, it's the word for Gentiles there, like for the day of the Lord is upon everybody as you have done and it shall be done to you and your deeds shall be on your own hand. See, Obadiah is like, oh, this is a short book, but then all of a sudden, as soon as you start peeling back the layers, you realize it's super deep. Let me show you why it's super, super deep here, Okay. It's because of the word Edom. It's because of the word Edom. Now, I'm going to show you some Hebrew here so that you can kind of understand what's going on. So Hebrew is, Hebrew, um, in the original way it was written, didn't have any vowels, okay? So it was all consonants. It was just written at, without any vowels. Later on, like, like, 1500 years ago, not even like after Jesus, they added vowels to it because they were beginning to lose their language and they, they needed to make sure everyone knew how to pronounce things. So here's what I want to show you. I want to show you what a vowel looks like. These are vowels. This is a vowel. This was added on later, okay, kind of in between two letters. These are vowels. This makes an E sound. This makes an O sound. This makes an ah sound, and this makes an ah sound, okay? So, so ah, ah, dumb, and then, and then this is, this letter right here, you know what sound that makes? It's like, all right, that's, like, like, like that's, that's kind of what that sound makes, all right? So, so it's got, you, you make that, like, that, that, that kind of face while, while you're doing it. But, take away the vowels. What do those words look like? They look like the same, don't they? They look the same. Ooh, it's getting deeper. And what does Adam mean? What does Adam mean? Do you guys remember? It means man, right? What, what is, so remember it says I, I created Adam and Eve, and sometimes we're like, oh, cool, Adam created a dude, God created a dude named Adam. Awesome. You know, all that stuff. No, no, what does Adam mean? It means humanity. It means humanity. And that's what's interesting about this book of, of Obadiah is that he keeps saying, Edom, you have sold off your own. You have not stood up. You've let your pride get in the way of helping out the people. All, all those things. And then humanity has been struggling and you've just watched them burn. You've enjoyed watching them run into the manure truck. Right? Right? You've enjoyed watching your enemies, your perceived enemies, the people that you don't like. You've enjoyed watching them run into the manure truck. It's this kind of duality of meaning of Obadiah that he's talking about Edom, but he's also talking about all of humanity. He's talking about all of us. And listen, I get it. I still, I love to see people end up in manure. We were over in day, on our way back from Jacksonville. We were in uh, uh, one of the doctor's appointments. We were in Daytona, and Daytona had this like monster truck rally thing going on. Like all these massive people, people with these huge lifted trucks were everywhere all around the speedway, and, uh, and we're stopping and getting gas. And then there was this one truck that had two captain's chairs in the bed, 
And, and the two guys in the captain's chairs on the bed of this massive truck that was taken up all of the lane, you know, easily all of the lane, are drinking the finest of beers, Bud Light. And, uh, and so, so they're, being, they're just classing up Daytona, right? And they're drinking Bud Light. And they're, they're drinking it, and I'm just like, and the guys are just, they're weaving in and out, and they're just, and it's like, where are the cops, right? And then all of a sudden, a cop comes flying up behind me. Kind of thought he was pulling me over for a second, but he shot around me, and, and he pulled over those guys, and I was like, victory, right? <laughs> like, yes, yes, finally, they're, they're sitting in the manure, right? They, I mean, they shouldn't be asking like that, right? We love it. We love it. And, and, and Obadiah is going, guys, 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 don't let your pride overcome you. Don't let your pride overcome you. Don't celebrate the downfall of other people. Don't celebrate that. And don't, don't celebrate their downfall. I have, and I say, instead, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Don't try to get to those high places. Humble yourself. Because a lot of times, we refuse to humble ourselves, and we'd rather humble our enemies, right? We'd rather see our enemies end up in manure, and we're like, yes, the police got them. Yes, that, that's, they finally got their comeuppance, and that's why we read Obadiah, because it's pointing to the problem of Edom. It's pointing to the problem of Adam. It's pointing to us, and this is our condition. But at the end of Obadiah, he begins pointing out this day of the Lord is coming. This day of the Lord that, that all of humanity, that there's something different coming. That this day of the Lord is coming, and God is coming in this day of the Lord, and he's going to humble something. But instead, God, from our Philippians thing, God ends up humbling himself. He humbles himself and he becomes obedient even to the point of death, even death on our cross. You know, this condition that we have, this refusal to humble ourselves, this, this condition of Adam, this condition of Eden, that Jesus came and he saved us by humiliating himself, by taking the manure for us, right? The, and that's what our epistle was about. And this is what Obadiah is all about. Like in, in, in Obadiah 21, it says here at the end of it that, that the Savior shall go up in the Mount of Zion and rule, the Mount, rule Mount Esau. Remember what? And, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. So that everything shall be the Lord's. It becomes this big, huge thing. And because God humiliated himself, because God humiliated himself, for God, because he humiliated himself to the death on a the cross, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, uh, every name of Jesus, every knee would bow in heaven on earth and under earth and every tongue would confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what does all this mean? Yes, we love the manure. We, we, we do, but it means this. That even in your love for all that manure, that Jesus came and he still saved you. That he died, he took it onto himself, that he has saved you, he's rescued you from the manure, and Jesus has lowered himself in humility, in humanity, to do that. So go live, knowing that you are saved and rescued by God himself, who in his glory humbled himself and, and save you and make you part of his kingdom. So, Go. Filled with humility and love for all those Edoms, right? For all those humanity, for all those people out there, position yourself in humility with them so that you're not looking to get, throw them into manure all the time, but instead you're there where you can lift them up and bring forgiveness, life, and hope, and love to each of them. And I think that is what Obadiah is about.